I'll start you off with a few of the problems. As you can imagine, when you make certain numbers or certain measures very prominent in the world, they become contested. People on different sides of the globalization story, those who support globalization as it is and those who don't like it, will have different uh, ideas about how things should be measured and uh, that leads to all sorts of interesting phenomena. So what you see here is the numbers uh, which are part of MDG 1, the first millennium development goal, numbers concerning the people who are chronically undernourished. These are the numbers that were valid until about two weeks ago. Uh, so what you can see here is that that number declined gradually until 1996 and then it picked up uh, uh, quite in accordance with the development of world food prices. That of course increased quite dramatically uh, in the period of 2005 to 2000 and well actually until now. They peaked in 2008 and then they peaked again in 2012 or are still rising I should say now. So these numbers, the numbers of chronically undernourished people, were grossly inconsistent with the poverty numbers of the World Bank, which you can see here. So poverty was falling dramatically, and chronic undernutrition was actually increasing since 1996. And so that led to a bit of an interagency fight, uh, or at least a bit of puzzlement and embarrassment. Why are the number of chronically undernourished people going up, and how is that consistent with poverty going down? Uh, here's one example of uh, what people did in response to that discrepancy. This is the Millennium Development Reports from, 19, uh, from sorry, 2011 where uh, the report is wondering about this discrepancy. The numbers are reported because they're both part of MDG 1. And the report then says in the bottom paragraph, which you can hopefully see at least if you're not too far away, the disconnect between poverty reduction and the persistence of hunger has brought renewed attention to the mechanisms governing access to food in the developing world very strange sentence. So the report authors cannot quite get themselves to endorse the explanation that there's something wrong with the distribution of food. But of course, that's what they need to say in order to make these two fig figures uh, or the two trends consistent, right? The poor people are having the money. There are fewer and fewer poor people out there. So the money is there. It's not poverty. is not the problem. And so if these people are undernourished, it's either because eating has gone out of fashion or it is because people somehow, uh, the food isn't flowing to where people are waiting with money in hand to buy it. So uh, this was the uh, somewhat strange response of the Millennium Development Goal. But then, uh, yeah, this is the food prices. So the explanation that I think uh, would make sense is that the way the World Bank measures poverty in terms of purchasing power adjusted incomes and consumption expenditures is simply insufficiently sensitive to the development of food prices. Of course, when food prices go up, that will have an impact on the inflation rate, but it will impact the inflation rate only to the extent that food prices figure in general consumption expenditures. So if food accounts for, let's say, 30% of the consumption expenditure in a country, then food prices will only account for 30% of the weight-wise of the consumer price index. Now, food plays a much bigger role in the consumption of poor people than it plays in the consumption of people in general. And so it's quite obvious that poor people will suffer more when food prices increase than the general population. So consumer price indices understate the importance that food prices have in the consumption of poor people. And that, I think, accounts for the discrepancy, right? You get a discrepancy because 
consumer price indices uh, are used to uh, work out you know what the general price level is in a particular country but they don't do justice to the increased i mean to the much larger share that food prices play much larger share of food expenditure among the poor so that i think would allow us to say both numbers are in a sense correct, right? We are measuring the consumption expenditure of poor people against the general price level and find that fewer people are poor. But on the other hand, given the actual consumption of poor people, which is largely based on food, we find that more and more people are hungry. Now, as one might have predicted, perhaps, when two agencies compete with each other and they don't like each other's numbers, then sooner or later one of the two agencies is forced to back down, and that's what happened now with the FAO. The FAO, a few weeks ago, published a 2012 report where they revised the number of chronically undernourished people all the way back to 1990. They have a new and improved methodology now, and you can see that very large revisions were made, especially in the year 1990, which is, of course, the base year for the MDGs. So you have now many more people hungry in 1990. And the trend now resembles quite well the trend that you find in the poverty numbers of the World Bank. I'm not sure that the new numbers are particularly credible, but obviously there are many different ways in which you can measure uh, the number of undernourished people. I, I'm not saying that the old methodology was particularly credible either. Uh, all that seems likely to me is that if you have a choice of different ways in which you can measure the number of undernourished people, uh, you will choose the measure that will give you the numbers that you want. And that appears to have happened here. The numbers are now much more consistent. So that's point number one. You will get uh, a lot of contestation over how to measure things. And uh, you will, in the end, find that the people who want to defend the status quo, who want to say that things are going pretty well, thank you very much, are going to win the day and get the methodology they want. Now, point number two is how do you formulate the goal? There was the famous World Food Summit in Rome in 1996, where the governments came together and said that they would half the number of chronically undernourished people between that year, 1996 and 2015. Here is the exact formulation that they used, basically with the immediate goal of reducing the number of undernourished people to half their present level no later than 2015. So this would work as follows. I'm now using the new numbers, which for 1996 had 910 million chronically undernourished people. So this is how it would work. You start with that number 910, you reduce that by 50%, so your target for 2015 is 455 million people. And if you look at the new number for 2010, which is 868 million, you find that you have made 5% progress. So of the 50% we were supposed to achieve by way of a reduction, we've actually achieved 5%. So that looks pretty catastrophic. come in the first Millennium Development Goal, which maintains the language of halving poverty, halving chronic undernutrition by 2015, but now presents a different interpretation of what that means. Namely, now what it means is to half between 1990 and 2015 the proportion of people in the developing regions who suffer from hunger. Uh, ditto for poverty. Now, there are two important modifications here. One is that you backdate the baseline, and we've just seen that the baseline has a higher hunger number in 1990 than in 1996, so you're starting from a higher base. And secondly, and more importantly, you are now halving the proportion rather than the number. The proportion has the number in the numerator and the population of the developing countries in the denominator. The denominator is growing quite autonomously, population is increasing in the developing world, 
And so a lot of the work of halving poverty and halving undernutrition is now done in the denominator, simply by growth in the base population. So whereas the World Food Summit promise envisaged a 3.58% annual reduction in the number of chronically undernourished people, the first Millennium Development Goal envisages a 1.37% annual reduction, so a massively less ambitious goal. Now again, let's do that with numbers. So we now start with a new number of chronically undernourished people in the year 1990 relate that to the population of the developing countries and find that 22.6% of people were chronically undernourished in the developing countries in 1990. This is what we now need to halve. We have to get it down to 0.113 or 11.3% of a much increased expected population in the developing countries in the year 2015. So the new target is 709 million. So what you need to notice is that the permissible number of chronically undernourished people in the year 2015 has gone up by 254 million people just through this little trick of reinterpreting what it means to half chronic undernutrition by 2015. And also 2010 now looks much better, right? We are looking at 868 million chronically undernourished people. We relate that to the population of the developing world in 2010. And we find that we have actually achieved a 35% reduction in chronic undernutrition by 2010. The same sort of thing happened with the poverty numbers, which are denominated in terms of $1.25 purchasing power parity of the year 2005. And you can see here three successive goals. The most ambitious one, uh, the green line, is the goal as formulated in 1996. The red line is the Millennium Declaration as officially adopted by the General Assembly in 2000. And the blue line is MDG1 as formulated in the uh, Millennium Development Reports. Here is one slight humorous highlight about all this, which is Kofi Annan's first report in 2002 about how we are doing with regard to the Millennium Development Goals. And you can see there that, according to this report, in the most populous region of the Earth, uh, East Asia and the Pacific, MDG1, at least the poverty number, the poverty goal, was fulfilled already in 1999, uh, one year before the Millennium Declaration, and well before the MDGs were even adopted. This is possible, of course, by backdating the baseline. We are saying uh, instead of starting in the year 2000 or the year 1996, we start in 1990. And so we count China's success against poverty as part of the achievement of the MDGs, which were adopted only after the new millennium. Good. So there has been a great deal of creativity spawned by the MDGs. I don't know whether the MDGs made a lot of difference on the ground in terms of poverty eradication efforts. I think you can probably say that they did focus attention to what was on the list of goals and maybe away from other things that, were, that didn't make it on the list of goals. But how much they really did by way of increasing efforts of important agents is unclear, at least. Here's another uh, bit of creative accounting, which is interesting to know. This is about the uh, poverty measurement, basically, again, in measuring it in how many people are living below a certain money metric poverty line denominated in purchasing power parity adjusted dollars of the year 2005. The World Bank has uh, used different poverty lines over the years. They started with a dollar a day in 1985, then they went to a dollar eight a day in 1993, and currently they're using a dollar 25 a day 2005. 
if you price these out in US dollars today or Canadian dollars or anything you like, you'll find that the poverty line has declined over the years quite a bit. It sounds like it's gone up from $1 to $1.8 to $1.25, but of course inflation was much greater than these small increases, so net-net it's gone down actually. And uh, the World Bank, of course, uses one consistent poverty line all the way backwards and forwards in time. So they're not cheating in that way, that they use different poverty lines to compare different years with each other. But as you can see on this chart, a lower poverty line delivers a better looking poverty trend. So if you take $1.25 purchasing power parity adjusted 2005 US dollars as your definition of the international poverty line, you find that in 2005 we were 40 percent ahead of target with regard to the first millennium development goal. If you had used a higher line, namely two dollars, you would find that we would have been 59 percent behind. And if you had taken an even higher poverty line, two dollars and fifty, you would have been 103% behind, which means you would have found that you were actually going backwards rather than approaching the target. So in other words, as it turns out empirically, the trend in terms of poverty and how many people are living below the international poverty line is very highly sensitive to how high or low you set the international poverty line. And so again, you can make the thing look much better if you choose your international poverty line lower. And as I just said, that's what happened in that we went from a dollar eight in 1985 currency to a dollar and eight 1993 currency and so on. So the poverty line indeed was progressively lowered. And so much of the success, much of this good looking trend that poverty is declining, is simply an artifact of picking a very, very low and increasingly low international poverty line. Now, while I say this, just think for one moment about what it would mean to live off a dollar twenty-five per person per day, thirty-eight dollars per month in this country or in the United States. Right? It is. Uh, these are purchasing power parity adjusted numbers, so don't think that this is a ridiculous amount here, but it buys more in India, it buys more in the developing world. It doesn't because the World Bank is already taking that into account. So it's already counting a dollar for which you get 50 rupees at the bank, roughly Indian rupees. Uh, 16 rupees are enough as far as the World Bank is concerned to get as much purchasing power as a US dollar has in the United States. So the World Bank is working really with a very, very low, ridiculously low poverty line from which it would be very difficult to buy sufficient food, let alone medical care, utilities, water, shelter, clothing, everything else that you need. But the very, very low poverty line has the advantage, as I said, that it delivers a better looking trend. Good. So. The development, the Millennium Development Goals, or goals of that sort, I think if we go on with the system and just put in goals of the same sort, we'll get the same sort of creative accounting forward looking. And I think that will not be particularly productive, certainly not the best thing that we can do with regard to the successors to the Millennium Development Goals. One thing that these goals were lacking was accountability having concrete specific agents who are responsible for particular achievements, right? The goals were disconnected. They were not really goals in any real serious sense by being disconnected from any agents who might have responsibilities with regard to those goals. Normally when we speak of goals, there is some agent or some group of agents who, whose goals these are and who are trying to pursue them, who are making efforts and so on. That was left completely unclear by the Millennium Development Goals. And so rich people, rich countries could easily say, well, these are the goals of the poor countries. That's what the poor countries are supposed to achieve. And the poor countries could just as easily say, well, you know, it's the rich countries who ought to do more in order to help achieve these goals. 
So what I think, the first thing I think we need to do in thinking about the successors is how we can move from these detached goals that are no one's goals in particular, that are just sort of wishes that we might all share and applaud, to agreed responsibilities where we attach specific goals to specific agents and ask these agents to make specific efforts and if they don't manage to keep on the glide path towards the goal, to make additional efforts in order to get back onto the glide path so that we have a, an assurance that these goals will actually be achieved. Now these goals, I think, should not be formulated in the area of development assistance. I think development assistance, as was also pointed out yesterday, is, has on the whole uh, not been uh, a particularly successful way of reducing poverty. And that is so for two reasons. One reason is that it's been too little, so uh, $120 billion is the current number. And uh, that is, even relative to the quite small international poverty gap, is a relatively small number. Uh, so the world income in the moment is somewhere around 70 trillion, and 120 billion is just a little more than one-tenth of one percent of that. Now, the other reason is that development assistance is very often paid towards for the benefit of agents who are capable of reciprocation, so it goes to export companies in the donor country or to friendly rulers in the developing world whom we want to, in one way or the other, keep on our side politically, the Musharrafs and Mubaraks of this world, in other words. And you can see that from the fact that only a small fraction, only about one-eighth of all development assistance goes to basic social services, which really make a difference to poverty eradication. What we should do then is focus in the next phase of uh, MDG successors, focus attention not on that very, very small part of the global institutional architecture that has to do with development assistance, but focus on that much larger other 99% of that supranational architecture that also has very important distributive effects and where if we can change that architecture to make it a little bit more hospitable to the poor, we can actually make much greater differences to how things go for the poor. That very big majority of the supranational institutional architecture is now shaped without any attention to how different ways of designing it are affecting the poor. And if we did pay attention, we might find that at much lower opportunity costs for the rich, we could actually do much more for the poor. So, and there, uh, what we are thinking about are institutional reform goals that satisfy these two conditions. Namely, on the one hand, they focus on this other part of the institutional architecture, and on the other hand, they attach goals to particular agents, give agents concrete responsibilities to change things. The areas in which we think institutional reform goals should be formulated, and we are now in a process of trying to get input from different experts in different fields and countries to fine tune these goals, are the areas of illicit financial flows, that one trillion plus that flows out of developing countries uh, each year due to embezzlement, tax evasions, and other such phenomena intellectual property rights, which constitute an enormous burden on poor populations, in particular in the areas of uh, medicines and seeds, uh, participatory and inclusive consultation, resource and borrowing privileges, which we talked about yesterday, uh, international trade protectionism, what's left of it, international labor standards, environmental sustainability, and migration. So in these areas, we could formulate concrete institutional reform goals that uh, would give very concrete, measurable targets to, in particular, the developed countries in terms of what they might achieve to make supranational institutions more poverty reducing. So here are a few examples of what such things might look like 
and I don't want to jump ahead of this participatory process that we are now running, but I just also want to give you an idea of what an institutional reform goal might concretely look like. So what you have here is uh, taxes on trade distorting subventions. Maybe I go through the these ones a little bit in a little bit more detail. So protectionist trade barriers distort trade, diminish trading opportunities for poor populations. They're often grandfathered in protecting markets of rich countries. And uh, to help offset the effects, we could have a tax to be paid on the amount of subsidies or export credits, any kind of subventions, that would go into a human development fund. You could raise substantial amounts of money. This would obviously have an advantage on the revenue raising side by discouraging such subventions, and it would rev uh, raise revenues for poverty eradication. Similarly, uh, pollution and climate. You have most of the benefits of uh, climate changing pollution accruing to rich populations. Most of the harms uh, are imposed on vulnerable populations in, in the developing world. And again, if there were some sort of a tax or fee on these polluting activities, that could be used to protect poor populations from the effects of climate change. And again, quite substantial amounts of money could be raised from that. And insofar as it would deter or slow down polluting activities, so much the better. Uh, arms exports obviously are extremely damaging to poor populations, in particular in Africa. And wouldn't it be nice if there were, at the very least, a tax on these arms exports that would make it possible to combat some of the damage that these arms are doing in the developing world? Multinational corporations often avoid paying taxes in developing countries by reshuffling their profits into low-tax or no-tax jurisdictions. Quite easy to do. If you are a multinational firm, you have subsidiaries in many different countries, and these subsidiaries trade with each other at prices that you can control. And by adjusting these prices in a way that will maximize profits in low-tax jurisdictions, minimize profits in high-tax jurisdictions, you can just make sure that your profits accrue in the Bermuda and not in South Africa or India. And uh, one way to combat that would be to introduce an alternative minimum tax that would require corporations to pay a certain percentage of their global profits in taxes, regardless of how much they pay in national taxes. Maintenance of secret bank accounts is something that I think in the wake of the global financial crisis, there's a real political opportunity to try to do something about that, because there's a lot of anger even in the rich countries about uh, how much money is escaping taxation. Uh, by one account that I've seen, Raymond Baker may be able to give us more precise numbers, I think about 21 to $23 trillion is sitting untaxed with, uh, in bank accounts in secrecy jurisdictions with nobody knowing who the owners are. But anyway, we'll hear more about that later. And large debts is another big problem. Many developing countries are chafing under debts that were accumulated under previous rulers that had no legitimacy whatsoever. But the country's population is still held responsible for those debts. And here we should try to find an institutional reform that would, at least in cases of clearly illegitimate rulers, make sure that potential lenders are put on notice in real time that any money that they lend to such rulers will not be the responsibility of the ruled to repay. Natural resource outflows, we have a similar problem there, that a lot of natural resources <coughs> are being sold by unrepresentative rulers. And again, we should try to take measures to at least make sure that some of the value of these resources sold accrues to the population of the country from which they are being exported, who are the true owners of these resources. 
And <coughs> finally, we have uh, this idea about pharmaceutical innovation, where we can allow, open up a second avenue on which pharmaceutical companies can be rewarded for their innovations rather than marking up the price of the product. They could also get uh, choose to be rewarded on the basis of the health impact that their medicine, their product achieves among patients insofar as they're willing to forego the usual reward, which is that of increased prices. So these are examples. These are not in any way canonical goals, but just examples to give you a sense of the kinds of goals that we should try to aim for in su as successors to the MDGs. That would be meaningful, and that would, I think, do a great deal more to reduce poverty than the MDGs or similar goals that essentially will lead just to a great deal of creative accounting. Thanks. What, w what were or what still are the Millennium Development Goals? Well, the Millennium Development Goals were labeled as the world's biggest promise to the citizens of developing countries. So they were an agreement which was unprecedented in scope and ambition to reduce the deprivations related to severe global poverty. Now, you know, w talking about the process that led to formulating these goals, it's really hard to trace exactly what happened. But what seems to be clear that we had a decade in the 90s of many, many conferences in which uh, stakeholders with many different agendas put forward very important ideas, and the result was a very, very long document with, I'm told, dozens and dozens of different goals and targets that we should strive for, which were developed through a relatively participatory and inclusive process. But towards the very end of that process, uh, in uh, the back doors of the UN, that big list was consolidated and streamlined into eight salient simple and uh, purportedly easy to remember goals that were supposed to focus the development agenda in the flow of aid and um, philanthropy money to priority issues relating to severe poverty understood multidimensionally. Um, whenever people say that to me, by the way, that you know, economists often say that what's good about the Millennium Development Goals is that they were so simple. There were just eight goals and therefore it's easy to remember. I often reflect upon the fact that even uh, I that work on them all the time, if you quiz me at night, I'll have a hard time to uh, remember all of them. It's kind of like the Ten Commandments. There's always one missing. But still, it's definitely much better than some of the longer lists you see in uh, UN documents. But you know, conceptually, uh, it's been said that the Millennium Development Goals are a meeting of two types of thinking. So on the one hand, what was very influential at the time, Amartya Sen's human development, multidimensional approach. And you can see that by looking at the kinds of topics addressed by the goals, right? So it's not just, it's definitely not GDP per capita, and it's even not just income. We're talking about education. We're talking about gender equality. We're talking about health. Um, as a very broad understanding as of what it means to reduce poverty. And the other way of thinking, which was, uh, I'm going to use now a, a catchphrase which was very powerful in the 19s and now has beca become slightly out of fashion, was the results-based management approach. Now I think we just say logic model. But you know, basically what that approach uh, says is that if you uh, lay out a plan, it is crucial that you lay it in terms of targets which are uh, rigorously measurable. So that at any given point you can measure have you succeeded and how far along you are towards that success. In that context, uh, just an interesting historical note. Um, you know, so I was fascinated by this talk about results-based management and the MDGs, because I, I, I know a little bit about RBM and about logic models, and from what I know, results-based manage management is about having plans. So a results-based management plan is a plan that has goals, has uh, outputs, that are supposed to lead to these goals, specifies particular activities that need to be taken up to achieve goals, and assigns particular responsibilities to particular agents that can be held accountable. But the MDGs are just goals. So if somebody, you know, if a college student submitted this as an assignment, write an RBM for global development, they would get an F. They would get an F written with a big red pen. 
um, I've asked uh, the person who wrote the MDGs, what's the deal? And so this is uh, from, uh, this is something I can share. This is from uh, Jan van den Burtele, one of the uh, two main people who were in the room uh, writing them. And he said, ah, results-based management was what everybody was talking about. But in the end, we had a couple of days and we just tried to make sense of the mess. And these are the Millennium Development Goals. And for better or for worse, and I'm not meaning to knock them, they did a lot of uh, good. They have shaped what we talk about in the development community. They have shaped the way uh, aid is prioritized. And they have shaped the priority of donors for a long time. And uh, on many of them, uh, there is indeed progress that can be attributable to them. Although there are also many problems. And on all goals, uh, progress has been uneven, especially in areas such as Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, South Asia, and especially for the most poor and excluded populations. One thing is for sure, the MDGs had an expiration date. And that expiration date is 2015. So all the targets in the MDGs are meant to be achieved by the year 2015. And what that means is that um, very, very soon, uh, a new agenda is going to take their place in that agenda, we hope, now I can also say, is very likely to shape the priorities, the global priorities for development, poverty alleviation, and probably also sustainability for the next generation. Now, there's a process going on. Um, the process right now is led by the UN, by various agencies of the UN, not necessarily also in communication. But one major pro uh, process we should all be aware of is the UNDP-led consultation process, which is a process that's leading towards an inclusive set of recommendations for the um, summit on the post-2015 post agenda that will take place in the General Assembly in September 2013. Now, in that context, two main things are happening. One thing is that the UNDP is holding a series of consultations with various stakeholders. So 50, at least 50, national level consultation in 50 developing countries. And nine now turned 11 thematic meetings, which will focus on cross-national and cross-sectoral issues, such as governance and accountability, health and inequality. In all these meetings, uh, the people invited uh, to participate are representatives of the global poor, um, stakeholders such as uh, business, media, trade unions, and academics. What this creates is a unique opportunity for people like the people in the room, people who are uh, academics that are interested in having impact on policy, to invest uh, resource researches and thinking resources into creating an impact which will last and which will uh, ripple through at least uh, 15 years and probably more. But I want to stress just how, you know, this is exciting, but I, uh, let me just take it down a notch and be a bit pessimistic. I want to st uh, stress just how difficult meeting this opportunity is going to be. So one thing we need to be aware of is the speed of the process. So September is the first hard deadline. And as things look now, the UN summit, September 2013, that's really soon, is going to settle most of the content, leaving uh, the details, which are also very important, very, very important, the what the economists would need to do, getting the indicators right, to 2014. But this year, not even all of it, the next 11 or 10 months, is going to determine the content. That's a very narrow window of opportunities. That window of opportunities is made even narrower by the fact that Ban Ki-moon has assembled what's called a high-level panel of eminent people led by David Cameron, to lead the process <coughs> of synthesizing civil society reports into a recommendation to the UN, which will be probably you know, the baseline recommendation uh, for content. And this process is happening fast, and it's running ahead of the consultation process. So the schedule actually was only released two days ago. And the schedule is that uh, on March, the author of the report, Homi Karas, will submit his first draft based on the consultations going on so far. Uh, and uh, in May, you'll submit the final report to the high-level panel, and that will be the civil society uh, 
or the, at least the negotiation uh, baseline for the discussion leading up to September. So there's an even narrower window of opportunities from here till March to have an impact on what goes into that crucial report. So there's a narrow window of an opportunity. There's a huge opportunity for impact. Uh, ASAP is trying to find a way to mobilize the resources that we, and when I say we, I don't mean uh, Thomas and I, I mean we, the community of people who have expertise and will to leverage that expertise in order to impact that process and get the best result possibly for uh, those who will be affected by it. So currently, and uh, Thomas mentioned this a bit, we are running three interrelated projects that together um, are going to be integrated into a strategy for impact. The first and the earliest is the Global Poverty Consensus Report, or GPCR for short. What we're doing in the GPCR is trying uh, to get past the first hoop in order to impact as academics. And maybe this is something I should have said earlier. So why am I saying that I'm worried about this window of opportunities? I'm worried because there is a way in which, as academics, or academics working in universities, we are not ideally set up to meet challenges like this. Short notice political challenges. Why? Well, because what these challenges require are haste, while academic inputs come in slowly and in a moderate way. We tend to focus on our nuanced theoretical disagreements, which is the way we get rewarded and the way we publish and the way we advance in our careers, when what is needed are clear statements of consensus, even when that consensus is not particularly interesting or publishable. And finally, there is a tendency among us uh, to micro-specialization and insulation within, within over-specialized uh, areas of research when what is needed by uh, civil society in the UN are the big picture recommendations for a new era of development. So the thought is that because of these natural, and they're very natural, and anyone who is in academia and is part of the rat race knows why. I mean, you're thinking about how to publish, the first thing you're thinking of, Okay, how can I say somebody, something that nobody said before? Or find another person and say, ah, that person is totally wrong. The thought, let's enter a room and discuss what we agree upon, goes against our nature. And should, except for the next few months when we talk about the MDGs. So the Global Poverty Consensus Report is a focused intervention, being aware that this is not you know, haste, consensus, and big picture are not going to come naturally, it has to be created proactively. And what we've been doing is holding conferences and dialogues, interviewing uh, the 50 people that we think have written most extensively and represent a diverse um, set of approaches and thoughts on what should replace the MDGs. And based on that data, try to construct, to build an overlapping consensus which goes beyond theoretical disagreements to practical policy-oriented recommendations that a majority of academics can stand behind and endorse collectively. I should say, of course, that we do not mean a total consensus, because unfortunately, even within academia, a total consensus would probably be so bland that it won't be worth the piece of paper on which it's written. We mean a consensus among those academics who care about uh, care and believe in the chances of uh, uh, global solutions to world problems, who think that the poverty issue cannot be postponed and has an absolute urgency, and um, who believe that there is a way and there is something that can be done using the resources that we have in order to make dramatic improvements to the life of those uh, living in poverty. So we go to those people that is the question we want to ask. For those who are committed precisely to the goals for which the post-MDGs are there for, what do these people, based on their expertise and research, agree upon are the must-have essential features that any replacement of the MDGs must have? And at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll share with you the first results, the unofficial result of what that consensus is starting to shape to be. The second project, which uh, Thomas talked about, is really a product of the first one. So even after interview uh, 10, uh, one thing that became clear is that there is a consensus around the idea 
of do no harm. And actually, it's interesting. There are at least three people in this, four people in this room that I've actually interviewed in the context of the Global Poverty Consensus Report, which are Thomas, Varun Gauri, Mira Tiwari, and uh, Raymond Baker. And there are another example of uh, four, and Sakiko Fakutapar, sorry, the first person I interviewed, actually, and the first person to set us in this direction. And their example of academics would, I'm sure, disagree on many, many things, although perhaps this group also agrees on many, many things, um, that see that do no harm. Addressing those uh, rules and practices that are institutionalized on a global level and are directly hindering development or palpably harming vulnerable populations, that is essentially, that should that it is essential that that be included as goals aimed to reform these institutional harmful practices in the new development agenda. And these are the seven main areas we identified through the dialogue and consensus process on which that goal should be constructed. So I won't go over the details now because Thomas already did it, but during questions, we are both happy to answer uh, more concrete questions. I should say that for each of these um, goals, we are building teams. Uh, a few of them are already built, for example, around illicit financial flows, intellectual property law, and participatory consultation. Um, and uh, Mina Krishnamurti, are you here, Mina? Uh, is the leader of our um, participatory inclusive consultation team, and you can talk with her about that. Uh, Mitu Sengupta, the, order, the organizer of this conference, is leading the Elected Financial Flows Group, and you can talk to her about that. But the idea in the end is to have, for each of these, a series of reports that will be published in time to influence each of the key political junctures. So, the high-level panel report and the UN General Assembly Summit. The final thing that we're doing is, and this is more, if you want, our role as supporters, we are um, acting as the providers of academic support, advice, and ideas for those excellent people in civil society that are leading the campaign for a legitimate and accountable replacement for the MDGs. In particular, we are, a member of, uh, we are members of a coalition called Beyond 2015, which is the largest coalition of civil society organizations. It, it uh, has it in its membership more than 400 civil society organizations from all over the world. And they are the official partners of the UN uh, from civil society in the consultation process leading towards September. What we are doing in that coalition is, first of all, providing answers quickly. So we've done something a bit crazy. We formed an academic quick response team, which is slowly growing. Yeah. And these are, you know, in my dreams, these are academics with beepers. At this time, they just promised to respond to emails in less than 36 hours. And, and I thank them for that. Um, and what these people do are, is, to, is to give answers, not after two months of research, but when they're just needed for a meeting that happens next week and is, has a huge potential for impact. And we are filtering these requests for, for mostly for beyond 2015, but we would also do that for any civil society organization that convinces us we have a chance for impact. We need research-based answers. We need them now. In addition, we are uh, in charge in that organization of doing the thinking and facilitating of participatory civic consultation in the UN thematic meetings. Um, and finally, in that coalition, we are in charge of the actual writing and drafting of the position paper on governance and accountability, which is an issue that, as you know, uh, ASAP is focused on um, quite intensely. So these are the, if you want, the three types of activities related to the post-MDGs that ASAP is pursuing. How does this translate into a strategy to impact the post-2015 agenda? The strategy as we see it starts at home. It starts with the Global Poverty Consensus Report in trying to figure out what is it that just as academics, just as experts, we think collectively, or we can, or we can agree upon begrudgingly collectively, are the minimum essential must-haves for the new agenda. But after uh, that is developed, we know that that is not enough, because we are academics, but we are not, most of us, those who will be most affected by whatever the new agenda is. And that's why parallel to that, and together with the UN process, we are facilitating a quite broad 
process of inclusive, participa of inclusive participation and deliberation directly with representatives of plural and excluded communities. And what is going to happen there, and here, let me just say, we're going the anarchist route, is uh, we are going to translate it uh, into, you know, the language that is uh, available to any person, explain exactly what it is that we are thinking, that we have developed as academics, as experts, and vet it against the thinking and the criticism and the explicit uh, desires and uh, thoughts of those who are actually going to be most affected by the goals. And there's going to be a series of processes. Uh, the first one will be in India, uh, three days of you know, open, chaotic discussion in which we see what is the response to these ideas. And it's also going to be a more structured by being there in the UN thematic and in the UN national consultations and collecting and soliciting rigorously and through surveys the responses. The idea here is to create an iterative feedback process with as many iterations as we can if the schedule allows us in which we revise our ideas developed internally based on what we've learned from the consultation, come back again, say, did we get it right, and iterate until two things happen. Either no need for further iteration, or we've run out of time and we need to put something on the table. Hopefully there will be time for iterations. What this process is going to create is a statement on what should replace the new agenda, which will have two dimensions of legitimacy the legitimacy of academic authority, and the legitimacy of the participation of those who interest, whose interests are affected. And here's a political thought, that if the academic consensus is broad enough, and if the participation is legitimate enough, we can perhaps ensure one thing. Not that all our goals will be signed by 193 states, that can't be ensured, but that it will become politically impossible to ignore or to reject without justification. And that will be our first measure of success. The second measure of success is to actually get some of these things into the new agenda. And that's what we will be striving for. Now, of course, uh, going back to the process, you'll ask, where are we at? So we are uh, at the top, uh, the two circles at the top. We are in the final stages of building the academic consensus. And we hope, in a little bit more than a month, to publish the first official draft, or sorry, the first official uh, report from the consensus project. And we have started to uh, secure the resources and uh, strategic partnerships in order to carry out the inclusive participatory process, as well as uh, do the academic work with a team of researchers or the experts on participation in order to know how to do this effectively. Um, the final thing probably that now uh, you would want to know is, okay, what then is the academic consensus? What have you discovered so far? So, you know, strictly speaking, I shouldn't say, right? Because uh, this is a process. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a process-driven project. And really, until we're done with the last survey, we can't say. Um, we definitely can't say clearly what is the consensus. But I can tell you that I'm surprised by how quickly uh, very substantive areas of consensus have emerged, and they've already mentioned one, the IRGs, I'll mention some more. This is uh, our best attempt to very, very uh, succinctly articulate what is the shared vision that we're finding among academics, and that shared vision can be divided into four labels or categories. That are categories for what should be essential must-have components in the new agenda. So the first thing is we need to have as we had in the first MDGs, a set of human development and sustainability goals um, which address poverty multidimensionally, but this time also equality and relative poverty, governance and especially global level governance, and sustainability issues. And uh, later on in the questions, uh, it will be interesting to talk about the relationship between the sustainability development goals and the post MDGs. And and this is the important point, whatever these are, and you know, all the issues that are on the table, health, social security, inclusion are important, whatever these goals are, to echo Thomas, what we need to insist on, and this is clearly a consensus emerging, is that they should not be detached goals, saying this is what 
should happen, they should involve some specification of who exactly is supposed to do what exactly to ensure that they happen and have a glide path in which we can measure when progress is not being made adequately and a process for correction and for uh, research diversion if indeed we don't make progress along the expected glide path. The second dimension is do no harm principles and this is the completely new thing that wasn't in the first agenda. So in addition to regular development goals specified in terms of outcomes for people, mostly, uh, mostly for poor people, we think that the new agenda should include goals that aim to change institutionalized rules and practices. And these are goals that put most of the onus of responsibility on the richest and not on the poorest countries. And there are actually an opportunity to introduce accountability into the new uh, agenda in an interesting way. Because think about it, if MDG 4, that's the child mortality uh, MDG, is not met in, say, Malawi, and you ask, well, whose fault is that? Who? Well, the MDGs don't say. Um, the best thing you can do is say, ah, the Malawis. Why don't the Malawis uh, take care of child mortality in Malawi? But that's it. That's as far as accountability can go. When it comes to these types of goals, if you ask who is responsible, let's say that an illicit financial flows goal would include a demand for country-by-country -country reporting. If you ask the question, who has not adequately performed country-by-country -country reporting, the answer can be clear. US, Canada, you have not met the goal. If we ask who has not uh, either removed the trade barrier or paid a tax perhaps if we go Thomas's route, we can uh, answer the question. It is uh, uh, Switzerland. You are still, uh, you're still uh, being protectionist about your uh, livestock. So these goals, even, even if we said nothing about accountability, just having these goals and measuring them means that there will be a built-in system of holding those that are most wealthy and rich accountable, which is something that was completely, completely devoid except for MDG-8, which did not have any numbers in it, completely devoid from the first agenda. The next category is the issue of research providing, which is also an accountability issue. So when you say we want to achieve something as big as the eradication of poverty, you need to say where are the resources going to come from? And here we would, uh, the consensus is, is, is that the goal should include specifications of where the resources come from, and there are two types of sources. First of all, there is aid, which is a small part of the picture, but it is part of the picture. And at the very least, I would say people would agree that um, OECD countries should meet the promised 0.7% of, uh, of uh, GDP target for official development assistance. But in addition to that, there is diverting of funds for harmful practices. So a lot of money goes to things like um, subsidizing environmentally unsustainable practices like fossil fuels or arm trades or excessive military spending. Another good example, and perhaps Raymond Baker can say more about this, is what would happen if we would close tax havens. This is interesting. I, I was in a conference and somebody says, talked about financing the, uh, the new agenda. They said, well, we cut down military expenses by, by 30 percent. That will be 500 billion more per annum. By the way, 500 billion more per annum relative to 120 billion today. Um, we divert uh, uh, subsidies from fossil fuels, it will be 300 billion per annum. And if we close tax haven, that would be 40 billion per annum. And I thought maybe Raymond Baker will think that it's a higher number and I'll wait. I'm getting a thumbs up from Raymond Baker. I just wonder, I wonder how, how much higher. But these, what's important to see here is that these diversion of funds from harmful practices that should be stopped anyway, and we're spending money uh, on them anyway, actually, if agreed upon globally, would add way more money than meeting the 0.7 goal in ODA. So these two things together, the aid and the diverting of funds from harmful practices should be there as the specification of what resources are going to go in to achieving the goals. And finally, legitimate processes to decide on resource use. So you know what the goals are, you know where the resources are coming from, now how are they used in particular, what are the priorities
things are not going right, how do you course correct? Who decides? And here the answer, and this is something that has a consensus, I think, which is absolute among the experts. The who decides has to be legitimate. And it has to be a true participatory process that engages with the most important stakeholders. And the most important stakeholders, of course, are those whose interests are most affected, the global poor themselves, the citizens of the world. And I would add the experts together with them. So, that is our uh, picture, that is our uh, preliminary and rough articulation of what the vision is. Through uh, further analysis and through survey, we hope to be able to put it together even more substantively. And we hope to corroborate it all through rigorous uh, surveying with a really broad number of academics. Um, but now I'd like to open the floor for uh, questions about uh, the project, criticisms, questions about Thomas' presentations. We are here to answer. I just going to ask, um, you know, I guess the MDGs are, do lack accountabilities in, in, firm, in a firm way, but are they not, is, not, is it not implicit in them that national governments actually pay attention and um, are, are, are held accountable by, by, their, by their electorates, by their populations? And I only think of this because two weeks ago I was in Indonesia and I was uh, interviewing the head of maternal health for the government of Indonesia. And she described a process where the president of Indonesia convened all of the uh, social services ministers and directors across the government about a year ago and said, you know, okay, the, the deadline is coming up for the MDGs. How are we doing? And what are we doing? And in her own field, in the, in the, in the field of maternal health, um, which is really, you know, MDG 5, it's one of the big ones, uh, she described a process where she was being pushed very strongly by her government um, out of concern for, for an accountability that is really built in. And so it seems unfair when you, a couple of times in your presentation, said that, it, that, that in fact there, is, there are no accountabilities. I think there are, in, in fact, quite strong accountabilities inherent in the MDGs. Yeah, so uh, accountability is basically, it's, there's nothing built into the MDGs. Right, where is the speaker? It's easier to fasten on you when I answer you because I couldn't see from the microphone. And uh, so I think that uh, it's basically not built in. It's of course there is a practice that the people in the rich countries and uh, international organizations and so on focus attention, right? They look at the government of the country that is underperforming, that is not meeting the, the targets and is expecting them to do something about it. So there is, in that sense, uh, a consensus, a chorus, and that is part of the problem, I think, that uh, it lets the richer countries too easily off the hook, right? I think it did galvanize public opinion, it did do something, but, but it... The right. Yeah, yeah. so, I mean, insofar as that works, that's a good thing, right? I, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm just saying it would be better if we had in the goals an explicit idea about what the division of labor is, who is supposed to do what to contribute, and that was completely left unspecified. Add one quick thing. So there were no uh, accountability mechanisms uh, built into the MTGs, and that's why the default uh, accountability is the government of developing countries. And that's what we want to change. Hi. Um, just following, <coughs> following up on this question of accountability, I mean, I, I agree that it was just not thought through. Um, number one, the, <coughs> the monitoring mechanism actually asks developing countries to report to the General Assembly on how they are progressing. I'm not sure that it asks rich countries to report on how they are progressing in meeting their goal eight obligations. 
But number two, I think the problem is much deeper than that because these goals and the, f I think there are, I don't know, 20 so many targets and like 60 indicators, they were never developed to be performance targets. By that, if you are a CEO of a company or if you are the head of, let's say, a hospital, a public hospital, you can be held accountable for delivering services to the public or to your shareholders or whatever. That's what accountability means and that's how accountability operates. The problem with these goals is that nobody's very clear about what the purpose of these goals are. They were not set through a, a process of real planning. I mean, real planning for performance of implementation has to be built on modeling, calculations, resources required, market demand, all of those things. This was not what was done. These goals were set as aspirational expressions of social objectives, important social priorities. They were not implementation plans. So how can you hold leaders accountable when they are not playing, they were, were they never conceptualized and set according to those rules. And an even worse part of this is that um, the, 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 by specification, they were universal targets that are imposed on countries with extraordinarily diverse starting points. So you are asking the countries with the least resources and the farthest distance to climb to achieve the same, to arrive at the same destination at the same time. So Mali with 60% of poverty rate has to go to 30% in 25 years. I'm just making these numbers up, by the way. Maybe Chile with 10% has to go from 10 to 5%. 5 so, you know, to say that these African countries are not on track to meeting their targets, which is essentially what the UN is doing, is absolutely scandalous because they are pointing fingers at the poorest governments with the farthest distance that they are not on track. Now, I have made calculations that show that actually the poorest countries that are farthest behind are some of the best performing ones if you actually look at the pace of progress. So, I mean, I think there's a huge amount of issues. I mean, I don't want to go through the <laughs> entire list, but I mean, I think this whole issue of accountability is not just a quick fix. I mean, I think it re requires a hu an, an entire kind of reconceptualization of, of what these goals are, are how they should be set, um, what is the role of the goals, what should be the role of targets, what should be the role of indicators, and a whole set of other things. Um, and how you ha have to incorporate some notion of universal objectives with very, very diverse uh, conditions around the world. Um, thank you. Um, I am uh, very much in support of this whole project, um, but I'm uh, confessing to some uh, disappointment and perhaps confusion um, there's no place in this discussion, it seems to me at this point, for social reproduction and the enormous investment of um, resources and work that go into necessary social care, paradigmatically children, but sick people, elderly people, um, most of which work is done by women under very difficult conditions, if you're speaking globally. And I spoke yesterday about coerced work with slavery at one end of a spectrum and various degrees of coerced work. I think uh, much of the work that women do uh, related to social production is coerced work. Um, I don't know where this um, is supposed to fit in, and there is a great deal of work available, of, of academic work available, related to this. So where, where, where are we supposed to go with these uh, concerns with, within this process? Uh, quick response, one of the do no harm 
IRGs has to do with international trade standards and, of course, decent labor and elimination of slavery and exploitation of uh, women in the workplace should be central to the work of that team. Thank you. Um, my name is Kurt Tannen from University of Guelph. Uh, I have a comment first to Thomas's uh, discussion because you could get the impression that, for example, when they moved uh, to these different poverty lines, that there is some arbitrariness in setting them, and that World Bank somehow actually understates it. Um, there's actually a very clear way how they are um, determined, which is uh, you calculate those PPPs, and then you take the 15 poorest countries' uh, national poverty lines, and you convert those national poverty lines into international and then you get the average and that's how you get the 125. Uh, it, actually what happened even between 93 and uh, the uh, 205 line is that uh, all of a sudden we had actually five, uh, a half a billion more people in, uh, in poverty as a result of a change and the reason was uh, that uh, the, po the national poverty line of India dropped from those 15 countries and India has a very uh, low poverty line, relatively low poverty line, so actually the poverty line went up uh, and it didn't go, uh, didn't go down. Uh, so so, so th th there's just one comment. So there's a very clear procedure of how you d come up to those numbers, which is the 103 and, and the 125. So um, I, I just want to give this as a comment. Um, th th the question I have is, uh, at, the, at the initial of, of your uh, point, you said, uh, well, there were um, a lot, uh, th there was this big list and, and that went into initial and then uh, are the back doors and what comes out is uh, the eight point plan. Um, so the question uh, to raise I think is uh, when we are talking about what should we do here at this point is should you uh, somehow anticipate those back doors and anticipate that uh, it will all be watered down and should that in somehow affect what we, what, what we do here and I actually believe it should. I think we should um, uh, I, I think we should you should think about how the ba ha what happens after the political process and um, um, to 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 prioritize and to get priorities and have uh, think about when we define those uh, pot uh, potential goals of how likely they will be uh, politically uh, uh, um, uh, achievable and so that we start to also to think about uh, actually the pragmatic uh, more pra pragmatically about the process and uh, so uh, for that reason i believe the list you present is way too uh, is way, way too large i don't agree with all the points uh, quite a few i, I disagree but uh, actually just f uh, said from that point i think it is way too ambitious uh, could i ask you a question so that's my my greatest concern is w when it all gets watered down in the back rooms what would you do at this point in order to uh, counter that? What it, it, it sounds like you have some ideas for us, so it would be good to hear. Well, I, what I think with the original uh, goals, what, was, what is good and what is the benefit now besides the accountability is that they focused our attention to certain things. And so the fact that we talk about how you measure poverty and what happened with those poverty lines, they go up from 1 to 3, 1 to 25, uh, even though there's no accountability, we talk dramatically about it, and we talk about the fact that when you revise PPPs, each time our poverty number changes, and then we start to think, is, why is that? Why is, why is it changing? Why has India all of a sudden way more poverty, and in African countries we ha somehow have uh, you know, similar or relative speaking, have actually less poverty, uh, poor people. So, so I think it, it, it focuses attention. And so what I believe is where we have uh, probably most uh, uh, is, is to identify what should we actually observe and probably to observe, to continue to observe the development of poverty, I think is, is, an, is an important point. But I think, for example, another important point is um, to observe um, uh, uh, the state of governments, to have a, a goal about the capacity, the capacity of, of, of governments, uh, because governments really are very different in, in developed versus developing countries. Uh, so for example, just observing tax structures in developing countries versus here, uh, here we have uh, rich countries uh, heavily depend on a progressive, uh, for example, income tax rate, while in, the, in developed countries, they most tax income depends on on, uh, on uh, indirect taxations, which is regressive in its thing. So this is, uh, so, so, and governments in, in, in any aspect play a very important, uh, very important role. For, for example, a, a comment also to Thomas's uh, point, 
at the beginning, what's the puzzle about uh, nutrition and actually income that you have these divergence? Uh, um, there is uh, I want a, a book uh, by uh, Banerjee and and Duflo, which is called uh, which is called Poor Economics. And what they do is they actually uh, survey, they use a survey where they actually go and survey the poor people and look how they spend their money. And what they, what they observe is actually the poor people just don't spend uh, money on nutrition, they spend things on others, o other stuff. So, so, and we're talking about the poor, we're talking about the ones that are at the 125 uh, poverty line. So that raises the issue that, for, that for example, um, uh, parents uh, just don't put the, the right amount of uh, of food on the table for their children. So you have a lot of under, uh, and and stunting for children just because it's 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 almost like a problem we have here, very similar, which is uh, just in the, in the other direction is that we uh, overstuff our children. So it's a, it's a matter of obesity here, uh, while maybe there it is a matter of uh, undernutrition. And how do we solve this kinds of thing here? Is often by, by uh, with governments and governments observing and campaigns. And you should you should you know you should you should feed your your children better. It's very important that you're fed well, etc. So, so I believe in 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 many aspects what we are talking is the government plays an important role, and I think one such goal is to monitor just uh, the, the how how government government works and to 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 define certain measures and just to observe how governments differ uh, and and uh, focus uh, attention to this. That's, for example, one suggestion. Um, I wanted to jump back to the monitoring and quickly say something in response oh. because uh, sorry to the last question because I was attacked on the point about how the poverty lines were constructed right and you're completely right that they took a very objective way of doing it they based it on the national poverty lines the lowest in the 125 anchoring exercise right the world's 15 poorest countries that was the the method but in the year 2002 they did it uh, as the median of the 10 lowest official poverty lines. And in 1990, uh, they did it as the eight poorest countries being clustered closely together, eight poor countries being clustered closely together. So in all three exercises, they did refer to national poverty lines, but each time they used a different method to do it. So to say that this is a non-arbitrary method is a bit of a joke. And uh, the other point to make there is that the national poverty lines are themselves, in most cases, determined by the World Bank. The World Bank goes in and helps countries develop a national poverty line. So again, it's not entirely uh, non-arbitrary, right? So I think that these poverty lines are still way too low. And about the Duflo point, uh, it's true that they make this point that uh, basically I joked about it saying that eating has gone out of fashion, that basically people spend less money on food now. It's based on pretty anecdotal evidence from very, very small numbers, right? To say that this explains uh, that millions and millions of people, the huge discrepancies between the hunger numbers uh, and the poverty number strikes me as uh, at least a daring uh, inference. Another thing that has recently been said, I mean, there have been uh, several things. I've had an exchange with Martin Revalian on the World Bank's website about that, where he said that uh, the explanation is that a lot of people forget in household surveys the food that they eat outside of their own household, and people now increasingly eat outside of their own household, and so they forget to report that. Sure, you know, that's possible, and uh, I can't say that it isn't so, but uh, certainly we need further uh, studies, large-scale studies, uh, in order to know that. Another explanation that's been offered is that people now live more sedentarily than they lived uh, some years back. That's behind this uh, improved methodology that the FAO is using. So there's always a just-so thing that you can say about why these numbers uh, run apart from each other, uh, either denying that there is uh, more hunger, uh, saying that it's a bad methodology, or saying, yes, there is more hunger, but that's really people just don't like to eat anymore, or they don't like, you know, if they have other spending priorities or something. But again, I think we need to do more and uh, better research in order to see what's really going on. Ask a question. I was excited about the increase in accountability and monitoring and evaluation, but with a stipulation of um, wanting to give a ground level of every time we ask a government to provide information back um, when we ask for a target or an impact, that affects what's happening on the ground. And for an example, like in Ghana, extension agents whose job it is 
to give information to farmers are no longer doing that because they're serving the 10 to 12 different governments that give them aid and they're specifically gathering whatever that government wants in whatever way it wants so sometimes 12 times the same data set but everyone wants it gathered in a different way and they're spending all of their time gathering that data to report back to you which means that farmer isn't getting any knowledge or technologies on how to produce more food so i would challenge you guys as you're creating the system that will allow us to have um, a better knowledge of impact to do it in a way that's actually going to um, accelerate growth for that subsistence farmer and think about that person like and maybe plug into the open government initiative that's happening in Africa and see if we can get some of that data in a way that causes less harm to that government and takes away less resources and time. Uh, uh, thank you for that comment. So that's actually one of the things that's been coming up uh, in uh, the emerging consensus that may be part of the things that are harming are how we measure and the resources going towards measurement. Happy to talk uh, to you about this afterwards, but we're considering to uh, open a new team just to focus on the issue of metrics and what's the smart way to measure enough to ensure accountability without creating uh, silos or uh, harmful allocation of resources. Thank you. Let's talk to Gludge. We're just going to take the last question of the Sandstone. Thanks so much. Um, I'm a big fan of what you're doing and very excited about the, the momentum that you're building. Um, I, one of the, and one of the, the, the uh, criteria that's up there is environmental sustainability. However, cultural sustainability wasn't on the list. And um, here I'm thinking especially of development projects that focus on uh, resource extraction and you can generate perhaps a lot of anti-poverty dollars by taxing those activities. But doing so, and perhaps you can even regulate those activities in ways that meet environmental standards. But that still doesn't take into account the impact of, uh, of this particular form of economic development on, uh, on, on uh, the, cultural, uh, the, the, the cultures of the people whose, whose land is being developed in this way. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to focus on that. One place to start might be to join the UN Millennium Development Goals and, and their uh, future iterations with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and because there is already now an institutional foundation for, for joining these two agendas together. Thank you, that's a very useful suggestion. I'd like to talk about this some more. <laughs>